I want you to listen very closely to this first sentence of this homily. And if you can possibly do it, try to memorize it as well. Okay? So, listen. There is no good that you could do that would make God love you anymore. There is no bad that you can do that would make God love you any less. That's a revolutionary thought, isn't it? We don't normally really look at it that way. There is no good that you do. There's no good that that you could do that would make God love you more. There's no bad that you could do that would make God love you less. Boy, roll around with that for a while. Roll around with that. It is revolutionary. But the truth is, God can only love. 100%. God cannot do anything else, but he is love. God, in God's essence, is love. He doesn't get love from some, someplace else. God is love. Well then, you may ask, what's the stuff about heaven and hell then? I mean, if God loves everybody, 100% can only do that. Why, why do we even have to talk about hell? I mean, everybody would be going to heaven, right? Wrong. Wrong. If I invite you over to my house, or, or let's say I invite you to go to a real nice restaurant with a fine orchestra playing, and, and I'm inviting you to come there and have lobster tail and filet mignon and nice red wine and uh, you know, good salad and a real tasty lemon dessert. Uh, if I invite you to this, and, and I say, oh, come, join me in this meal. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of friendship, deep friendship. Come, come. All you have to do is show up, and it's all yours. You just have to say, yes, I will I accept this. I want to do this. But no, I'd rather stay at home and eat cold pizza in my dark room. Uh, I'd rather not even eat at all tonight. I'm, I don't care if I starve. It doesn't matter. Now, if that person is not delighted with the music and the fine, uh, you're on the top of a beautiful uh, you know, overlooking a beautiful valley, you know, this restaurant is absolutely gorgeous. If you miss out on that view and that fellowship and that, that wonderful meal, is it my fault? Is it? Is it my fault? No. Whose fault is it? Yeah, you're to blame. I'm sorry. If anybody ends up going to hell, it's not God's fault. It's your fault. For not going, yes! So yeah, you still have the option. You remember the cup analogy. One's turned down, one's turned up. The one turns away from sin towards God. The other turns away from God towards the life of sin and disobedience. God's always loving, perfectly. But spouncing off the bottom of this cup, not going to happen. You've got to turn toward him to receive it. So it's all about our receptivity. You know, uh, it's all about our, our ability to receive what God gives and our willingness to re- receive it. Again, let's focus on God. The first letter of John says, love consists in this, not that we have loved God first, but that God has loved us first. He initiates and sent his son as an offering for our sins. In the gospel, the landowner pays those who went to work at the last hour the same as those who came and worked all day. And he paid them first. This does not make sense according to our human standards. The whole point of the gospel is that, ready? God is generous. It's not about us. It's about how God is generous. And if anything good comes to us, it's not so much because of what we do, but it's very much about who God is and what God does. Thus, we confirm the first reading when God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. 
As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. So here is one of the most comforting realities of all time. God is love. And there's no good that you could do to make him more love, to love you more. There's no bad you could do that would make him love you less. Again, in summary, the gospel is not so much about what we do as much as it is about who God is. I just want to turn to the tabernacle and say, glory to you, God. God, we praise you, we bless you, Jesus. Jesus present within us. Jesus here in the Holy Spirit. Jesus present. We love you. We adore you. We praise you. We glorify you. Thank you for being so beautiful, so magnificent, and loving us with a perfect love. So I have a little question now. Here's a host. Okay, you're looking at a host. It's consecrated. You're going to receive it in Holy Communion. How, what percentage is Jesus present there? Would you say it's like 38%? Like how much of it is bread? And how much, you know, whatever, you know. How much, is he there 89%? Oh, good. Who said that? Way to go. 100%. He doesn't, he, he is 100% present. So think about these people who worked at the first hour and the last hour. He can only give 100%. He's not going to give any less. God gives his total self for us. When Christ gives himself, he gives 100% of himself all the time to everyone. Now, are we receiving it? That's the question. So, your assignment. As you receive Jesus in Holy Communion today whether that being coming forward or as you, if you have to make a spiritual communion. Consciously, to the best of your ability, realize that he is there and consciously be 100% receptive to receiving him in every aspect of your life. And so also do your best to give 100% of yourself to him with everything you have and are. You will see me at Holy Communion. I, I, I often go like this, right? You know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying to the Lord? I've told you before, but I'm going to say again. Jesus, my God, I accept you into my body, into my mind, into my heart, into my soul, into my entire being. I, I accept you. You're giving yourself to me 100%. And Jesus, to the best of my ability, I give back to you my body, my heart, my mind, my soul, everything that I have and am, I give it back to you. Try to pray that way. And hence, your communion will be truly holy.